Hello and welcome to Learning with Lovo. Today I will be discussing air-to-air -air radar in DCS. My first subscriber requested video. Leave a comment below if you have an idea for a video you'd like to see in the future. I'll go over the basic ways airborne radars work and how to make yourself more difficult to detect. Then how our aircraft translate and display that for us to use. Let's start with the basics. How radars work. Radar or radio detection and ranging has been around since the start of the 20th century and development continues to this day. In its simplest form, radar involves sending out electromagnetic radiation, in this case, radio waves. This will bounce and reflect off what it hits to various amounts and eventually reach the emitter again. The time taken to do so can be used to range the reflector as EM radiation moves at the speed of light. The direction and elevation of the reflection plus the range can be used to pinpoint the reflector in space. The range of the EM radiation itself is infinite, but the strength of the wave decreases with the inverse square law, which is to say, very quickly. And as it has to reflect and return also, the wave continues to weaken on its return. This is why our radars have maximum effective ranges, so an aircraft further than a certain distance away won't be detectable, depending on its radar cross-section. Distance is one method of avoiding detection. Conversely, the closer you are, the better a radar can detect you, even if you are using some of the evasion tactics I'll describe later. There are three methods of airborne radar detection we make use of of DCS, pulse, pulse doppler, and continuous wave. With pulse, a short burst of radio waves are emitted. This will bounce off an aircraft and the reflection will return to the emitting aircraft. As mentioned earlier, the time and direction of the reflection will give you a distance and direction of the reflecting object. Radio waves bounce off many different surfaces. The ground is a large source of unwanted reflections. Most of our aircraft can filter out the ground clutter. However, the closer a target is to the ground, the harder it is for the aircraft to tell it apart from the clutter. This is one manner of hiding from a pulse radar. Conversely, the sky has no useful reflection, and the water is good at absorbing EM radiation, so an aircraft flying above the horizon or over the water will stand out clearly to a radar. This means you can fly lower than another aircraft to increase your chance of detecting them. Pulse Doppler with a pulse Doppler radar, you have all the features of a pulse radar, but now you can take advantage of the Doppler effect. The classic example of the Doppler effect is how a siren sounds higher pitched when approaching you and lower while traveling away. Though this is with sound as opposed to light, the effect works in the same way. In both cases, we see a shortening of the wavelength while the source is approaching, which leads to an increase in frequency and a decrease in frequency when the source is departing. With sound, the shift is in pitch. With EM radiation, such as visible light and radio waves, the shift is in what we interpret as color. Though we cannot see radio waves, the effect is still occurring. We describe this as redshift and blue shift, as those are the colors on the low and high ends of the visible EM spectrum. The aircraft is aware of the wavelength and frequency of the radio wave it emits. When it receives a reflection, it can compute the shift to give a relative closure velocity. And the aircraft knows how fast it's going, so any reflection shifted to that amount can be said to be stationary and approaching at the speed you are flying at. These reflections can be filtered out as ground clutter. A blue shift would mean the reflection source has additional velocity towards you, and a red shift means it has additional velocity away. This helps the radar pick other aircraft out, as anything travelling over a certain speed is likely to be of interest. You can make it harder to be detected by flying at 90 degrees to an aircraft. This will give you a closure rate the same as a stationary object, making it possible it will filter you out. This is known as notching. You can combine low altitude and notching to make yourself very difficult to detect. Continuous wave. Finally, we'll discuss Continuous Wave, or CW. This is the radar method used for guiding some radar-guided missiles, and therefore the way your RWR knows one is guiding on you. Here, a continuous transmission of radio waves is beamed at the target, and the reflection of this is picked up by the radar receiver on the missile. This is quite distinct to the pulse-based methods. It's the radar equivalent of a spotlight being shone on you. The CW radar can be taking advantage of the Doppler effect of the reflections as well as other things like frequency modulation. 
but can be defeated in the same ways as discussed above. That's not to mention the ways to defeat the missile itself. Let's talk about scanning and tracking. I've simplified the idea of a radar to a wave emitting from an aircraft, but it is actually more focused than I've shown. Your radar doesn't magically cover the entire sky. It emits and checks a small wedge of the sky, moves and checks another, and so on, creating a scan zone that takes time to fully scan. You can affect this scan zone in a few ways, which is useful as it isn't hard to miss some areas where other aircraft could be. You can slew the scan zone up and down, as well as left and right. In some aircraft, you can also widen the zone in width and height to cover more area. However, the radar itself is always working as fast as it can, so increasing the area will increase the time it takes to scan that area. Thus, your radar will spend less time on any one particular area. This is one of the reasons a GCI or data link is so useful, as knowing where to focus your scan zone can greatly reduce the time to detection. B-scope. There are a variety of ways to display radar information to a pilot, and we most often see the B-scope. This is a top-down display of azimuth and range. You can expect a range indication with marks to show divisions of that, as well as some ways of showing where the radar is in its scan zone. This is a mock-up of the Hornet's B-scope, where we can see the cursor. This is movable to control the scope and shows the high and low limits of the scan zone at that range. Radar returns that make it past the filters are shown as bricks. How far they are to one side tells you the direction of the return, and how high up the B-scope tells you its range. It is important to note that the B-scope is a warped display. The scope is a square and the scan zone is a wedge. This means that side-to-side -side movement of a return far away is much greater than the same movement close to you. And a return at the bottom right corner is not far away to your right, but very close to your front right. Scanning versus tracking. When a radar is scanning, it can simply apply its filters and display the returns. For your radar to be able to guide a missile onto a radar return, it has to build a track file. This is a continually updated file of many data points from the radar return. It allows your aircraft to compute the weapon employment zone, steering cues and other info. I will go over range while scan, single target track, latent track while scan and track while scan. Not all aircraft have all these modes. Range while scan. Range while scan, or RWS, is the most basic scan mode we can expect to see. You are shown a B-scope with bricks. The bricks will fade until they are updated. You can see azimuth and range, but there is not enough data to build a track file. This is useful for searching for returns and keeping situational awareness, or SA. Single target track. If you select a return in RWS, the radar will focus on the area the track was and will attempt to find it. If it finds it, it will focus the radar solely on that return. It now has more constant data and builds a track file. You will get launch and steering cues as well as its altitude, speed and aspect. As your radar is focused on one spot, you can no longer scan other areas and you will lose some SA. However, the radar will adjust itself to maintain a lock as best it can, meaning you can be hands-off of the scan elevation and direction tools. This increase of radar transmission over the target will alert it that it is being locked. Latent Track While Scan Latent Track While Scan functions as range while scan but allows you to soft lock one return. This will give you the information an STT lock would give you while allowing the radar to continue to scan. However, if you fire upon the lock to return, the radar will switch to STT. This gives you more SA than range while scan alone until you fire. Track while scan. Track while scan allows you to scan as in range while scan and fully track several targets. This mode allows you to fire on several tracks depending on the weapons you have available. A Fox 3, such as the AIM-120, supports this getting tracking updates from your aircraft until it is close enough to attempt to track with its built-in radar. As this negates the need for you to reflect a continuous wave off the target, the target won't be alerted until the missile gets close enough to use its own radar. This greatly reduces the time and space the target has to defend itself. Whilst this mode gives you the best SA and weapon capabilities, it is the most complex 
as you have to continue to control your radar scan elevation and direction to keep the tracks covered. If you fail to do so, you can lose the track. If this is a track you have fired upon and the missile is too far away to lock it on its own, it will no longer guide. PRF. Finally, let's touch on pulse repetition frequency, which is the high and medium you often see changing on your B-scope. This is where things start to get a bit technical for me, so I'll do my best to sum up what I've read and heard. This will be greatly simplified. Pulse width is the length of time the radar emits for. It will then wait for returns and pulse again. The wider the pulse width, the greater the energy it is emitting. The greater the energy, the greater the reflection. Effectively, this increases the range we can detect things, but limiting how often the radar can pulse. The shorter the pulse width, the more often you can pulse, the more returns you can get from a particular target. Pulsing more slowly, like in our medium PRF, allows for a longer range of detection. Pulsing faster, like a high PRF, allows for more definition, but less range. As far as I can tell, medium PRF works for general all aspect detection and for longer ranges. High PRF works better for high aspect detection at shorter ranges. We can also set the radar to interleave, which alternates medium and high as it goes. This will give you some of the benefits of both worlds, but if you know the range and aspect of your target, you will do better to focus on the correct area and most appropriate PRF. I know this is to some degree simulated in DCS, but to exactly what extent, I can't say. That's all I have for air-to-air -air radars. I hope you found it useful and interesting. Let me know in the comments if there are any topics you'd like to see me cover. Thanks for watching. Learning was Lovo.